Hi, in this video I wanted to briefly discuss the Fermi gas model of the nucleus. So the Fermi gas model is a nuclear model which is quite similar to the picture of the electron gas model in metals. Now to understand it better, let's look at what is a Fermi gas. So to simply put, Fermi gas is a collection of non-interacting fermion particles which are stuck in a potential. Now what are fermions? The fermions are quantum particles like electrons, protons and neutrons which follow what is known as the Pauli's exclusion principle which simply states that if there is a collection of fermion particles and there are energy levels in that kind of a collection of fermi fermion particles then no more than two of the fermion particles can occupy the same energy level and even in that case they will have different spin or opposite spin. Now, unlike fermion particles, there is another class of quantum particles known as boson particles, which do not follow the Pauli's exclusion principle. So in the case of bosons, if there is a collection of boson particles, then n number of boson particles can occupy the same energy state. So unlike bosons, in the case of fermions, only two of these particles can occupy the same energy state. That means only two particles among a collection of particles can share the same energy values. Such a collection of particles would resemble a Fermi gas. Now what is meant by gas here? It gas simply means that the collection of particles are not interacting with each other. So gaseous state is usually distinguished from liquid and solid state in the sense that in gaseous state, most particles or individual molecules are moving freely most of the time and they are only interacting with the nearest neighbors very rarely as opposed to liquids and solids where the particles are interacting with its nearest neighbors almost all the time. So Fermi gas is simply a collection of such fermion particles which are moving freely in a given volume. Now how can such a Fermi gas model be used to replicate a nuclear model? A nucleus is a very small, dense, compact quantum object. And if you have seen my earlier video on the liquid drop model of the nucleus, there I made an assumption that each particle inside the nucleus is interacting only with its nearest neighbors. So in a sense, the assumptions of the liquid drop model are very different from the assumptions of Fermi gas model. In the assumption of the Fermi gas model, we assume that the net effect of the interactions of each particle with its nearest neighbors can be approximated to be a result of an interaction with a general potential field. So each particle is present in some general potential field and each particle is independently interacting with the general potential field. Now inside a nuclear volume, the mass density of the particles is almost constant throughout the nuclear volume and it drops to zero only near the boundary. So it can be assumed that whatever potential exists inside the nucleus has a constant depth for the entire volume of the nucleus and it drops to zero sharply near its boundary. So basically we can approximate the general potential field of the nucleus with that of a square well potential. So a square well potential has constant depth for a particular distance and it suddenly drops to zero near the boundary. So in the Fermi gas model of the nucleus therefore, the nuclear potential is approximated by a three-dimensional finite square well potential. Since neutrons and protons are fundamentally distinct particles, their potential wells are also going to be distinct. Neutrons interact with each other via the nuclear force, protons interact with each other via the nuclear force as well as the Coulombic repulsion. So the potential well of neutrons and the potential well of protons will be distinct from each other and the neutrons and protons will occupy energy levels in their own potential well. Since neutrons and protons are fermions, so no more than two of these neutrons and protons can occupy one given energy level. In, in their own individual potential well energy diagram. Now in the ground state configuration of such kind of a nuclear well structure, almost all these particles will try to occupy the minimum energy level. So two of the particles will occupy the ground state, the another two particles will occupy the first excited state, another two particles will occupy the second excited state and on and on and on. So the minimum energy configuration will consist of a large number of particles which fill up these energy levels one at a time. So even at zero temperature, even at uh, ground state configuration, the collect combination of the energies of all of these particles will be non-zero. 
In such a ground state configuration, where all the particles occupy the minimum energy levels possible, then the nucleus can simply be assumed to be a collection of particles where each particle has certain energy which is different from each other. Now what is going to happen if two neutrons come together and collide with each other? Let's suppose there are two neutrons which are at two distinct energy levels and they are moving inside the nucleus and if they come and collide with each other, they simply will result in the exchange of their energy levels. That's it. Classically, if two particles come and collide together, then in an elastic collision, they basically exchange their velocities, right? But in the case of quantum particles, since these two particles cannot occupy the same energy level, and let's suppose these two particles are basically moving inside the nucleus and they occupy different energy levels in the energy level configuration, then a collision would simply represent exchange of these two particles in their energy levels. Now since these two particles are identical in nature, there will be no difference in the overall configuration of the entire system. So basically a collision will lead to no net change in the overall energy configuration of the system. So therefore we can assume that this collection of particles which consists of a lot of neutrons and a lot of protons having different energies are moving independently of each other not interacting with each other. So this is the reason we can assume the nucleus which is a very compact object to be a Fermi gas because all of these particles are existing in their own energy levels and hardly interacting with any other particle of the same type. Because even if an interaction does take place, it only leads to an exchange of energy levels which hardly leads to any change in the overall energy configuration. Now in the ground state configuration, the highest occupied state has a certain energy and this energy minus the lowest occupied state is known as the Fermi energy of the given system. Now there is a way to calculate the Fermi energy of a nuclear model. In my previous video, I calculated the Fermi energy of both neutrons and protons for a typical nucleus. I basically assume that the nuclear structure resembles a three-dimensional finite square well potential and by using the expressions for the quantum mechanical solutions of the energy diagram, I calculated the Fermi energy for both a nuclear potential well and a proton potential well. This is the Fermi energy or approximately the Fermi energy of of a square well potential which contains n number of neutrons and according to my calculations I found out that for the case of neutrons the Fermi energy is around 43 mega electron volts and for the case of protons the Fermi energy is around 33 mega electron volts now of course the Fermi energy of protons and neutrons are going to be different because in a medium to large size nucleus the number of neutrons is more than the number of protons so if the number of neutrons are more the neutron density is going to be higher compared to the proton density and because of this reason the Fermi energy of the neutrons is greater than the Fermi energy of protons. Now since Fermi energy is basically the energy difference between the highest occupied state and the lowest occupied state, we can use this to calculate the potential depth of the nuclear potential well itself. So if you look at the case of the neutrons, the highest occupied state is at the energy level of around 43 mega electron volt. What is the amount of energy that I have to give to the nucleus to free the neutron in the highest occupied state that is known as binding energy. So what is the binding energy per nucleon for a neutron in a nucleus? It is around 7 to 8 mega electron volts. So if 7 to 8 mega electron volts is the amount of energy that I need to provide to a nucleus to free the highest occupied neutron then what is the potential depth? The potential depth is basically the sum of the binding energy per nucleon plus the Fermi energy. So the potential depth can therefore be approximated to be equal to 43 plus 7 mega electron volts for the case of neutrons which adds up to around approximately 50 mega electron volts and for the case of protons the total potential depth is around 33 plus 7 mega electron volts which approximates to 40 mega electron volts. So as you can see the potential depth of neutrons and protons is not the same which is kind of obvious. What are some of the successes of the Fermi gas model of the nucleus? Since Fermi gas model assumes that the particles are bound in a potential well, then these particles will only exist in discrete or quantized energy levels. So that, that means the nucleon particles, both neutrons and protons, have their distinct energy level diagram inside the nucleus. 
The second is that it explains the pairing of neutrons and protons. So since neutrons and protons are fermions and they occupy these distinct quantized energy levels, then no more than two of these particles can exist in one given energy level. So you have two neutrons of opposite spin pairing up to fill one given energy levels and two protons of opposite spin pairing up to fill its own energy levels. This is the reason why even-even nuclei are much more stable compared to even-odd nuclei and which are much more stable compared to odd-odd nuclei. So even-even nuclei are those nuclei who have, which have even number of protons and even number of neutrons. So what happens if a nuclear configuration have even number of protons and even number of neutrons? It leads to complete filling up of the energy levels. There is no unpaired neutron or proton. Because of this, this kind of a configuration is much more stable compared to an even-odd nuclei or an odd even nuclei which basically consists of an even number of protons and an odd number of neutrons and vice versa. In this case you have an unpaired neutron or a proton and the least stable are those configurations which have odd odd nuclear configuration which have odd number of neutrons and odd number of protons basically means that you have two unpaired neutron and proton respectively. So in a way this explains why even even nuclear structures are much more stable because it leads to pairing of neutrons and protons which fill up the energy levels of a nuclear energy diagram. And lastly but most importantly it also gives an explanation for the beta decay processes. Now the number of neutrons and protons in medium to large nuclei are not necessarily equal but they rather follow what is known as the NZ graph or the stability curve of an NZ graph. Those nuclear configurations which deviate from the NZ graph usually undergo beta decay process. So why does these beta decay processes take place? So if you look at the energy level diagram of any given nucleus, then the Fermi energy for a stable energy level diagram is usually the same for both neutrons and protons. But if you take an unstable nuclear configuration where the Fermi level is not exactly same but rather the Fermi level of the protons is greater than the neutrons or the Fermi level of neutrons is greater than the protons, in that case that configuration is unstable because it has more energy in the entire configuration. It leads to the possibility of what is known as beta decay processes. So in beta decay processes a neutron can get converted to a proton or a proton can get converted to a neutron. So if a neutron occupies a higher energy state compared to a proton in its highest occupied state then the neutron can get converted to a proton and thereby occupy a lower energy state in the proton energy configuration and therefore decrease the overall energy of the entire system. System. And similarly, if a proton has a, occupies a higher energy state compared to the neutron in the Fermi uh, uh, energy, then the proton can get converted to a neutron and thereby balance the overall energy of the entire system. So those nuclear configurations which are unstable have Fermi energies which are not equal to each other and that leads to the possibility of beta decay which leads to change of protons into neutrons or neutrons into protons to balance the overall energy of the collection of particles. Thus the Fermi gas model of the nucleus which assumes that the neutrons and the protons inside the nucleus are not interacting with each other but rather moving freely inside the nuclear volume and they are only interacting with an overall nuclear potential which resembles a square well potential. It can explain the existence of nuclear energy levels, it can explain the pairing effect which leads to more stable even even nuclear structures and it can also explain the existence of beta decay processes for those unstable nuclear configurations that deviate from the ends and graph. That is all for today's discussion. See you in the next video.